The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. I am back with Al Blumkin, Sabra Superstar. For those of you who don't know Sabre, Sabre is the Society of American Baseball Research. Did I get those right, Al Blumkin? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And you are indeed a superstar. Uh, Tell me and our audience, what got you started in Sabre? What year was it? And uh, what are some of your experiences with the group? Well, a friend of mine uh, uh, named Harvey Porras, uh, I met him at a uh, card show in 1974 when they were very, very few. And uh, uh, either I was looking, I don't remember that exactly, either I was looking some stuff and he was waiting for me, or he was looking at some stuff and I was waiting for him. We struck up a conversation. We became good friends, and he told me about it. He was one. Of, he was, I think, number 47 when it started up in 1972. And I joined in 1974, so I was in the top 200. And of course, uh, through the years since then, uh, it's traded quite a bit. But uh, oh, quite a bit. How many members are, are there nationwide? There's about now? six, seven thousand. But oh, okay. basically, the average age is around 60. At this point, that's one of the big problems. Is there's not too many uh, young people that uh, you're interested in this stuff. Uh, yes. To tell me about it. <laughs> it's just uh, it's a changing world. And, yeah. Um, and uh, one of the reasons it's changing is, uh, I think, is uh, just off the top of my head, is the record book has been bastardized um, by recent events in terms of... Yeah, uh, plus everything is, you know, to go with ball games a small fortune now. Right. And we have the age-old problem. Um, those of us who want to see baseball flourish and be passed on, how are you going to get the kids interested in going and build memories and what have you when, it, you know, you're talking about $200 for a family uh, to go out there or uh, for a ball game, for four people in the family, drinks, stuff at the uh, at the gift shop. Um, yeah. The, the ticket. Also, the starting shop. times. Uh, yes. Yes. Another thing that's uh, uh, the national mag- one of the national magazines had an article that somebody posted about uh, how the, the insanity of the local TV program. That uh, you know, if there's a dispute between your cable company and uh, the team, that you won't get to see your team. That happened with the Yankees and Comcast two years ago. Well, look, they, just, um, the they couldn't come to an agreement, and there was that at its worst. Of business yeah, my brother was a big Yankee it. fan. He was out in Long Island, and uh, the was now Optimum, which is Cablevision, which is owned by Dolan, the you know, the car that owns the Knicks and the Rangers. Uh, they couldn't get together with Yes, so uh, which is the Yankee Network, which is the Yankee Network, and uh, so in 2002, I think it was, they didn't televise any of the you know, games. Uh, if you were on that cable system, you couldn't get any Yankee games, uh, except for the well, few that were on uh, the local the station. So my, bro- my brother threw out uh, what? Scully. Yeah, when five, when five, when when. Verizon came out with Fios. My brother threw out the, uh, you know, got a choice. He threw out Cablevision and bought Fios. In. But that's that, that 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 that's been it. You know, the Dodgers, of course, with uh, Scully, they had uh, when they moved out to LA. I mean, the only games that they would televise at all, and this was after a lot of prodding, was the uh, visiting games in San Francisco. Hey, this Gene Hutmaker joins us. Uh, sorry, I got stuck in traffic. That happens all the time. You doing okay, Gene? Yeah, not all the time, but sometimes. <laughs> no, I mean all the time with folks. And, right, right. Uh, so, Gene Hutmaker, we have Al Blumkin here. Hi, I'm Gene. Here. Hi, Al. We're talking, Gene, about the travesty 
that made it possible for in Vin Scully's last year of broadcasting, he, he was heard by a fraction of the audience um, uh, just because of a cable dispute with Time Warner. And um, it was uh, a travesty that um, he wasn't, wasn't heard and he got to retire uh, virtually uh, silent, let's put it that way. And that's what's determining, uh, big business is what's determining uh, who we do see, what games we see, and um, the packages we buy. It's, uh, it's not right, as, uh, as they say. Uh, Al this this used Gene, to be Channel 9 uh, and Channel 11 back in our day. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it was, W-I-N-X, W-P-I-X, right? W-O-R. Yeah. Uh, W-O-R, right? Right. So, yeah, it was several years we, ago. But we did have the Million Dollar Movie, too. Yeah. Yes. C- CBS, uh, a few years ago, they had a uh, uh, this a big dispute with Time Warner, and they were off Time Warner for about a month. And uh, and uh, they, you know, they, they settled it like uh, several days before the NFL season was supposed to start. Craziness. Yeah, because they both came to the realization that they they cut off the football telecast that they'd be screaming all over the place. Right. Well, I don't recall when Red Barber went to the. Uh, went to the Yankees from the Dodgers. But my time, basically, Red Barber, I just really recall him as a Yankee announcer. Now, he went to the Dodgers, I th- the, the Dodgers to the Yankees, I think, after 1953 or 1954. Right. right. Because he was he was regarded as a Ricky man. And he made a couple right. of okay. criticisms of uh, uh, O'Malley, and O'Malley uh, yeah, did not O'Malley take very like well to criticism. Yeah. And he also did one other thing. He kind of, you know how the... Gillette would sponsor the World Series, and the announcers were the home team announcers, and they were being screwed. Um, and Barber stood yeah. up, and he said he wanted more money to do it, and um, that helped him ease his way out of Brooklyn. He you know, Larry McPhail brought, it to, brought him to Cincinnati, and when McPhail took over the Dodgers, he... Uh, Brought Barber with him, and uh, after McPhail left the Dodgers, uh, you know, Branch Rickey took over there. He, uh, he inherited Barber. Do you recall that World Series little book that the Gillette used to put out back in them days? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was a great book. And I don't know if you guys recall a picture book that had the Gillette put out where you'd flip the pages and it was like a little movie, and it had the sequence. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was Paul Richards. Yeah, you're right. I do remember that. Right with yeah, Paul, yeah. and he's going through the signs. You flip yeah, the book. Yeah, it's a flipping book. Just, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it was the same size as the other Gillette book. Yeah, you're talking about. But uh, that one really stuck in my head because you'd flip the book and he'd be changing fingers and what have you, and he'd be talking yeah, oh about yeah, yeah, yeah. indicators. And, um, but we got to learn a lot about ball from publications. And um, it was a big part of it, big part of it. My... Uh, co-host on the Yankee show. You guys may know Marty Rose. Marty Rose's uncle was a fellow by the name of Murray Rose. And we're talking about learning stuff from publications. Murray Rose was an AP sports writer and a good friend of Hal Box, um, also on our network back in the day. And Murray Rose edited a sports publication um, that was an all-star baseball publication. And it was, it comes out and um, in about
about 62 or 63, and it traced every All-Star game, the start, you know, the lineups, the box scores, stories about who was voted in and how it was voted in, um, way back. It's a gem. I happen to still have it. I'm saving it for Mert, and um, it um, it taught me about you know the All Star Game process and gave me a respect for judging talent through the years by just seeing who was chosen for for the All Star Game um, and the circumstances around it. it Great publication. That's I remember that. discovering the sporting news. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. 14, yeah. Considered the Bible. Uh, and the All-Star game was really big. Then. They, they downplay it now as an exhibition. Bud Field put it on for home field advantage, whether you agree with it or not. So it didn't mean something then. But once players started getting free agency and changing leagues, uh, it, it kind of like, you know, got watered down to some degree. Yeah, because, I mean, you can't imagine Mickey Mantle playing for the National League or Willie Mays playing for the American League. Right. Because you know, the only players that really moved was, like, Johnny Mize, uh, Hank... Now, Frank Hurt, Robinson. Like your, well, Frank yeah, Robinson was the only player in the 50s or 60s that moved at his peak. Well, Bunny, Bunny was one. Well, yeah. Than that, hardly, you know. I mean, and like Enid Slaughter, they were at the end of their career. Yeah, yes. Yeah. They were at the end of their career, and the Yankees could afford... To pick them up because they had the they had the money. Ralph Kiner because Briggs didn't like him in the Yankee uniform. Well, wasn't there interleague trading? No, that that's had become uh, legal until uh, legal until nineteen after nineteen fifty nine. Well, my mother's oh, neighbor okay. was was the reason why she became a Yankee hater was Hank Barrowi, who was ten and five with the Yankees in nineteen fifty five, and he he went to the Cubs and. He went 11 and 2 and was selected the National League Sporting News Picture of the Year, and it was the last Cup to win a World Series game until the past World, World Series. So, so that now I, I probably asked game. you this before, Gene. Wouldn't it have been natural for you, through your mom and Borelli, to have been, been become a Cub fan as opposed to a Cardinal fan? Oh, not really. She, she, she didn't really become a Cubs fan, and he kind of, uh, once the war ended and the real players came back, it was, you know. But no, she, she, she kind of rooted for the Cardinals, but she was she was Polish, and Stan Musial was a, probably the most famous Polish player, so she kind of liked, liked Musial. And me as a kid, my decision was based on the uniform. The two Cardinals on oh. a red bat for, a, you know, an eight-year-old. It was kind of a, better than an NY or a B or a NY or a, See, well, nothing was better than the Giant NY. That look, the New York Giant NY, especially under uh, over Willie's head, um, was just the classic. But, however, I'll amend that, and especially when the Giants left in fifty at the end of '57, the Brave uniform really stood out to me. The, the classy chief uh, on the sleeve and um, the, the what became a slur with Jane Fonda uh, yeah. later on the tomahawk chop and but we didn't know from uh, you know Indians Native Americans and and what have you that was a, that along with the cardinal uniform um, is after the Yankees and um, and the Giants and, and the Dodgers, I have to say, to classic, classic uniforms right there. Braves and the Cardinals are right up there. Couldn't think. Of I, well, the the Cardinals went, I think, yeah. 1957, one year without the birds on the back. Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane did that. Frank Lane, yeah, and there's such a stink that the, you know it was only less than the one season. He, he, the basis of that was playing them double headers in August. The Cardinals on the bat had too much uh, weight on them. Oh God! That that, that was that was Frank Lane's reasoning. <laughs> Is that right? That the patch he, he had to try and justify. Much weight. Great justification. The uniform itself, the uniform top itself, 
when it was sweaty and wet, they'd uh, they'd weigh it. It'd be like seven pounds alone. They take take it off. It'd be seven pounds. I'm sure the patch made <laughs> made the the difference. I, I know. Incredible. Yeah. Also, now every team has ten different sets of uniforms. Oh, Arizona makes me sick. They've had maybe 20 different combinations over the years since they were formed, and each and every one of them looks like shit. <laughs> Just pure pure and simple. The, they do something they, to offend one's sensibilities. That's all. It just... Um, that they're terrible. Tampa Bay is terrible. Hell, the Mets have done some bad things over the years. I remember once getting up, and I think Cliff Floyd was wearing a white ice cream hat. You know, it's like the ice cream man came with a white hat and a little blue thing on it. I hate those those things, and I also hate the way both the Cardinals. And the Angels, and you could take the Phillies along with this, their colors were primarily, back in the day, blue and red. Red was the color of the, the brim or whatever, the, uh, the off color. Now, it, all three teams are all red. The caps are all red. I think yeah, the Phillies, cap. Phillies uniforms look like what they, what they wore back in the Whiz Kids days. And the pirates wow, have had a, pirates have had a lot of them, and I I couldn't you know they brought, uh, the they the cardinals and I forget who else brought out those pillbox hat pillbox box hats right, the pirates. in, 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 in nineteen seventy six because the hundredth anniversary is in that I, I, I couldn't stand them Willie wearing one of those yeah I couldn't stand them yeah that um, but yet you look back on the pirate hat now with the stars. Uh, and they have these throwback uniform days and what have you, and it be, I guess because it was Stargell and Clemente and all those guys, we are family. I mean, Yankees. They had one where the Yankees uh, put uniforms with nicknames. Yes, also D. They did this once last year, and uh, the Yankees never had anything on the on the back of the uniform except the number. They've never put names on the back, ever. And uh, it was just, you know, it's, it's, they, may, they manufacture more crap that they try to sell. Well, I, I think the parents have, have more money. I don't think parents back in my, my day would buy a whole bunch of different hats. Then they, well, they didn't no. make them anyway, but right now, oh, parents, different they let hats. buy whatever they want. I mean, one hat. <laughs> I would have taken one hat. Um at a time now, it's it's gone crazy. It's marketing. I understand that it's big business, and I understand it's what's what pays the salaries. But now you know, I realize how many hats the Angels have had since their existence. They the Halo had, hats, the L.A. you know Los Angeles LA, Angels, California Angels, Anaheim Angels. Uh, Los Angeles Angels at Anaheim was what they are now. Disney hats, and it yeah. turns out those Disney hats were the only hats that they wore, that they had when they uh, won the championship. They, those Disney uniforms, the yeah. teal and what have you, didn't particular, particularly, as an angel apologist back in those days, didn't particularly like that uniform. But I like the classic Blue, red brim, with the halo on top, that and uh, classic L.A. They were originally yeah. the Los Angeles Angels, and now, now they're they, 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 the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Again, yeah, they've come full cycle. Um, they have that cap with the wings. Yes, that's the. the I mean. Wings. That's the one. It was a Disney. Yeah, the Red Sox haven't yeah. changed much. The well, there's no the only more thing. Ta- who, yeah, no the only thing the Wahoo. Tigers have changed basically is the, uh, you yeah, know, the names on the back. The uh, Dodgers are still the same, essentially. Right. The Yankees will always be the same. 
Yeah. Uh, the Mets, I got to give them credit. They went to the Black Michigasu a while back, which was uh, okay in a way. They did it fairly taste, tastefully, and um, they've had some minor uh, changes in the uniform along the way. The trimming. I happen to like that um, that St. Louis Cardinal type shoulder patch that the Mets had. Um, I, I think it was '86 when they won. As a matter of fact, when, when they won it all. But um, yeah, some of some of the uniforms are, are so offensive. But it's interesting to me that the Houston Astros, who were the first to really to re- the first uniforms to really offend, um, even they look good on a. When you throw back the uniform, when they have these throwback days, you picture J.R. Richards or whatever um, in those. Um, I'll go along with it. um, The only thing I won't buy into is Arizona and Tampa's uniforms. And the Pirates had a few years where they had uh, three different tops and three different pants. And they come in not knowing which one they're going to, which you know what the what what it was going to be for the day, and that it was you know that they, that the management would decide that they're going to wear this combination today. You know the A's the A's um, have that or had that, and probably still do. They change off not as much as they did under Charlie Finley, and the way um, teams with alter, alternate uniforms decide which uniform they're going to wear is it becomes the pitchers of the day, his choice. Uh-huh. It, um, I don't know if that's all teams, but I I know that's how the A's were doing it. And um, so they, I don't know if you guys remember the, the Indians in the mid seventies had these uh, these uniforms that were uh, you know were all orange, top and bottom. No, they were red. Red, whatever, and uh, they got Boo Powell from the Orioles. He put one of those those uniforms on. He, like, he felt he like, like a he big felt like tomato. A, he felt like a tangerine. <laughs> but the tomato, uh, yeah. You know, if you ever see a picture of Frank Robinson hitting a home run in his first day as a manager of the yeah. Cleveland Indians, that's the uniform they wore. Yeah. That day, the, the red uniform. And, and the White Sox had one season with the shorts. Yep. That well, the that 70s didn't... was kind of flamboyant. The flamboyant era of uh, yeah. I, I, I used to wear flower shirts with the with the with the flare slacks, and it was a time of uh, the guys were really stylish and outward. Well, you uh, wore. Uh, I'll bet you wore a leisure suit at one one time or another. Yeah, I, I had one leisure suit. I only had one. <laughs> okay, you. <laughs> me too. I was like, I'm a, um, we're of that era. Let's put it that way. Couldn't escape. You couldn't and, escape. and it was the hair. The, 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 hairy, the hairy age also. Like Oscar Gamble was the uh, legend. And that oh, yeah. the hair and White belt and the white shoes. That You could always uh, always tell, tell someone from that era. Um, I remember guys like Mike Schmidt dressed like that. Um, Make the pride of the Cardinals and Phillies. I think it was second to Gamble and... And hair on the head. Yeah, he had, a, he had a lot. Right. If you want to see a good player, uh, a good picture of ball players dressed in civilian clothes in those days, I think it was the Pirates that had a bol- like a bowling league or what have you. I just remember a, big, a picture of a bunch of players. Maybe it was a tournament for, for charity or what, and what have you. And these guys, like you say, with the big collars and the the, the flowered shirt and the, the paisley or and what have you. Boy, we've come a long way since then. You're right, Ralph. Finley was the one who started the whole thing. Yes. Hmm. Um, it looked like a parakeet, innovative. one of the green parakeets. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
Hey, guys, let's talk about something that I, I'm very curious to learn from you both about. And um, that is the what they call the, in baseball the managerial trees. And um, it's one tree, the managerial tree and the branches that come off. And at the top of the tree is Branch Ricky and John McGraw. And uh, start with Al Blumkin because he's been thinking about it for a while. Okay, well, uh, Branch Ricky was the one that uh, uh, basically uh, nurtured the Rocher. You know, had Frisch as the manager of the Cardinals for a number of years. And DeRosha learned on the, on both of them, and then the DeRosha and Frisch got into a, uh, got to a point where they wouldn't talk to each other. He sent DeRosha to the Dodgers when McPhail made him the manager. And DeRosha, if you look at that, uh, the, the 51 Giants team, uh, I think five, five or six of them became major league managers. Uh, Alvin Dark, Bill Rigby, uh, White Lockman, uh, Stanky, Westrom. Westrom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was a, uh, was a, a number of them, but it, it's not, it doesn't run as smoothly as uh, football, because football is always, uh, you know, you have, a, you know, quite a number of coaching trees in football that, uh, you know, have uh, been successful. And, uh, uh, and uh, Stengel, of course, uh, you know, came from McGraw. Right. Well, if you you mentioned those five or six guys, maybe yeah. more, the roast that went on. How yeah. about the guys that coached or managed or played under guys like Dark and Stanky and what have you? And I know Dark basically had the old, on. you know, his old giant. Uh, when he was the Giants, he had the old Giant comrades. Lockman was a coach there, and Larry Jansen was Larry the pitching Jansen, coach. Larry Jansen, right. West Westrom coach. West Westrom, he became the Mets, Mets manager. Right. And as a matter of fact, Lockman, number 25, one of my favorites as a kid watching the Giants, the New York Giants, he comes, he becomes third base coach in 62 and holds up Matty Alou at third base. And you remember that at the end, um, um, McCovey lines out. Ralph Terry t- told the story so well. Um, McCovey lines out, and to Richardson, that was boom. It just ended that quickly. And Willie Mays always criticized Lockman for that. He says, if it were me, I would have let um, Matty and Lou go. And if I got the stop sign, I wouldn't have taken it. I'd have run right through it. I'd have taken he would have done the Enos Slaughter of 46. Right. Right. Hey, and, uh, you know, you know I, I have Stengel. Talk about that. The center fielder that day was a guy named Culbertson. If That's because the back field hurt his ankle. Yeah. Sliding into second base on his double in the uh, seventh eighth yeah. that tied it. Right. He was taken now, out. there's a player playing today. He, he's been up and down named Culbertson. Grandson. And he's that first child. He's a grandson. Holly Culbertson's grandson. Yeah, he's but, a grandson of William Culbertson. And Culbertson's dad, the other Culbertson's son, was a minor league prospect with the Giants, and I signed that Culbertson to his tops contract, so, so no. I don't think he ever ever got up for a game. No, never played it, it. But he was a minor leaguer for a while, and as a matter of fact, somewhere I think I have a copy of that contract. I used to keep it, keep extra copies, a lot of guys I'd sign. I think I have that that Culbertson contract, but it's. I'm just throwing it in there because everything in baseball you talk about every play, every every situation, every trade, every you could go off on a tangent from that 
talking about players and just talk all day. Well, they, yeah. they were saying on that play would elude it. He would have probably it was kind of a given that unless there was some screw up that he would have been out by 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 a good margin. Uh, yeah. Uh, Matt Maris made a good play on it. And... I can't imagine Willie not getting in there. If it were Willie. If it was Willie, yeah, but it, it was a Lou. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lou was fast, though. He, he was fast. And, you know, you know uh, who came out of the Dodgers system as a manager? Who's that? Dick Williams. Oh, you're right. He came up through the Dodgers system. At 53, he was a rookie card. Yeah. And uh, a rookie card. Yeah, and uh, you know he had a, a fairly nondescript playing career, but he came out of the Dodgers. Whitey Herzog originally came out of the Yankee system, even though he never played a game and, for him. And Whitey Herzog learned the instructional league theory from yeah. DC, and th- he used that all his managerial career. And I don't know if he is Herzog in the Hall of Fame. Yes, yes, yes. He is well deserving guy. Uh, another Yan- Yankee that came out, uh, <coughs> well, Yogi obviously came out of there. Uh, Hank Bauer, who won, wound up winning a World Series with the Orioles. And Ra- Ralph right. Houck. Ralph Houck, yeah. Hey, I got to tell you something about Whitey Herzog and how instrumental he was he, uh, in building the Mets championship in 1969. He was the farm director all those years and uh, for the Mets, and he ran the instructional league for the Mets. He coached along the way. He had these guys all along. If you look in Met, Met history, he was very instrumental in them winning that um, that 69 championship. You know, Gil Hodges was, also came, obviously came out of the Dodger system. <laughs> Right, right. And I read something recently, maybe Al Blumpkin told me, maybe it was Peter Goldenbach, maybe it was Gene Huntmaker, on the Dodger bench called up in September, wasn't eligible for the World Series, uh, was in 51 when, during the playoffs, was an outfielder by the name of Bill Shawman. Yeah. Who, he was uh, tossed out of the game when the uh, last week of the season there was a uh, game against the Boston Braves and uh, the winning run scored on a play that Campanella went crazy about. Uh, Campanella got thrown out of the game and the, uh, and the uh, uh, argument escalated and uh, he, I think it was Frank Dascoli who was an umpire at the time who was very hot tempered, cleared the entire Dodger bench. Oh. The Shaman, of course, went on to be a no pro basketball player with the Celtics and uh, Hall of Famer. coached the you know, coached the uh, uh, Lakers uh, when they had the year where they won the 33 straight. And if the Held the all time free throw record. Yeah, and he uh, also coached the team in the ABA. Want now I'm going to ask you if he, here's a trivia question: Who broke Shaman's se- single season free throw percentage record? I say Rick Barry. No. Mark okay. Price. Ernie D. Gregorio. Oh, Ernie Nodi. Yeah, he he led the league in assists that year. <laughs> they used to they used Ernie to call Nodi. him they used to call him Ernie Nodi because his defense was horrible. Right. That's he why he left longer. He played with Bob McAdoo. Yeah, Buffalo, yeah. Which is not Buffalo, which is now the L.A. Clippers. Yep. Well, they were going to be UCLA in the uh, finals. They were up by a lot with him and Marvin Barnes, and Marvin Barnes busted his leg and had to go wait, and they had a, uh, they had a big lead at the time. From well, Providence and UCLA. Didn't have Marvin Barnes, an author of Marvin Barnes' book? Yeah, don't uh, don't remind me of that podcast. You didn't like that show? No, I hated it. <laughs> oh God! I, I remember calling you up after that and telling you never put me through something like that again. And I had to be the the uh, host because you, it was a problem when you were in. Um, 
Yeah, I I don't remember what I, you might have, but I sat there. I don't know what it was. Yeah, it's I, it's, you had to sit there to turn. I think an hour and a half, an hour and a half on Marvin Barnes, something I'll never get back. That was something about the time machine. You'll never get back in your life, Al. Yeah. You made a comment about the time machine. We said the the time zones were changing. Yeah. Because I'm not going in no time machine. But uh, the thing is, uh, every time you you saw an article of Marvin Barnes after his latest escapade, he's always referred to as the troubled forward. (laughs) To me, that became his nickname. TVTF, troubled forward. It's amazing how these guys got through college because they had to play four years then. It's amazing how some of them actually got through their college career. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can imagine the cheating and the tutoring and, and academic fraud that went on to keep keep some of these guys eligible, of course. Well, I, I, I knew a tutor. He was uh, working for Wimp, Wimp Sanderson at Alabama. And this guy, he's, his, his son was a wrestler at a high school. And he was a tutor to make extra money in Alabama. And he was tutoring this 611 guy. So the 611 guy comes in to him, here's, here's my homework, and he left. He was going to leave. The guy, where are you going? He goes, huh. I'm leaving. I'm giving you my homework to do. He goes, look, I don't do your homework. I tell you how to do it. So the guy left. So he, he, he tell Wimp Anderson, to get, and, they, and Sanderson didn't get rid of the guy. <laughs> he, he, he did cut him. He just brought it in for the tutor to do the homework. He didn't, right. he didn't do it. A couple of years ago, either. they asked some Ohio State football player about classes. He says, classes? I'm not here to go to classes. I'm here to play football. Yeah. Well, Notre Dame did that back in the 30s and 20s, too. Yeah, they all did. I, yeah. I will give the, the story. I must have mentioned this 50 times on the air, that you McElhenney, the great running back. At yeah, the king. The king. Yeah, the king, yeah, um, and he was great, boy. He had these the shake and bake moves that were... <laughs> Harry had no knees left by when he retired, though. His Pardon me? Bone on bone with his knees. Oh, really? All his cuts. Yeah, all his cuts. Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. Um, point being, he gets to the pros, and they asked him in an interview, what's your biggest adjustment to the pros from college? And this is 52, was it that era? Um, and he says, the pay cut. <laughs> yeah, there's a story I, I, uh, I've read several places. Remember the old first baseman, Ferris Fane? I do. We're great when on base percentage. Yeah, when he, yeah, when he went to the A's from the San Francisco Seals, he was very lucky to, to, even though you know the Seals were Coast League and the A's were Major League, he said, "Yeah, he said he took a pay cut to go to the A's." Oh, they paid they paid great money, and it was a yeah. The A's pay, money. especially the A's, they paid nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, Connie Mack was uh, by that time was just a little little tight. And they have like these eight eight day road trips in one place. Yeah, seven days. They, you're they traveling played Seattle. San yeah, they played Francisco. seven games in six days. The six, Sunday was always a doubleheader. Then Monday was right. a travel day. They'd be in the same town for a week. What a one! And it's all yeah. on the West Coast. The West, on the West Coast. Yeah. No pressures. Um, oh yeah. They played very know. long seasons, also. Long seasons. And 180 ahead. game seasons. 180 yep. games. Yeah. I didn't imagine you have like 270 hits or something. Yeah. Oh wow! There was a, a player in the he had a long hitting streak. At, 51 in, games. Uh, he had, there, was, there was a player named Paul Strand who was playing for Salt Lake City had a team in the, the league in the 20s. That league in the 20s. Guy got 325 hits in a season. <laughs> Mac Kenny oh. Mac paid uh, a ridiculous amount of money at the time for this guy, and he couldn't. Couldn't cut it in the majors. Yeah. Well, some guys are four A players. Yeah. Yeah, not but they made Lefty Odul one around there too, right? Lefty Odul. Oh yeah. There's a, a lot of them. Uh, the, the, there's a guy on the uh, uh, the Angels uh, that played there for like Stats, Jigga Stats, his name. Played there for like 20 years with small interruptions in the major leagues. The guy had, I think, over over 3,000 minor league hits. 
Well, that was like back in the forties. You had the uh, industrial basketball league. I remember. Yeah. I think I think Curlin was. Uh, yeah. Two, two time. I think he played for the Phillips Oilers. Yeah. And you had the Akron Goodyear, and they would give him hey, the management job. Do you remember George, George the Yardley plays team? George Yardley plays that team. The Olympic team shows two guys from that industrial league. One of them was Odie Smith, this future uh, Cincinnati guard. He, he was MVP of an All-Star team. game once. Wasn't it Adrian Smith? Yeah. Yeah. Adrian yeah. Smith, yeah. Yeah. He was MVP um, of an All-Star game. Yeah. There was so another, there was he another he player was named... The uh, industrial league. Another yeah. All-Star from the industrial league that never went to the NBA. It was a player... Because I remember this name because it was so unusual. B. H. Warren. Yeah, right. Huh. Yeah. Kansas. I played for Kansas. Yeah. George Yardley played in the league for, uh, I think, a year or two before he came into the NBA. They give you a management job. You get them playing yeah. basketball, you still have your job. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what, uh, you know, they I'm sure they give you time off and what have you. Yeah, you basically get the management job to, to play basketball and... Promote, you know, it was, and being no TV there, I'm, I'm sure that they drew fans. Right, right. Oh, that, right. Was um, that, that was for years. That was for years. Besides, the Yankees are playing the Marlins. On the branch, uh, the one day in two. Well, I'll tell you another one who came out of the Stengel uh, era and that became a fairly successful manager was Al Lopez. Does he no, play for Stengel when Stengel was managing the Dodgers? Didn't know that. Didn't remember that, maybe. But I know they came up against each other an awful lot. Oh, yeah. In the American League. Um, and there was an example of uh, an Hispanic. He's probably the first Hispanic manager, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's... Yeah, he can, he's he's actually a native native of Florida. Ah. But it, it seemed mostly like the managers were mid, midfielders or catchers. Yeah. And or, or 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 people like a Herzog who was an outfielder who didn't play much and could be on a dugout learning the game. Whereas the stars really be really didn't go into managing or or weren't that good. Well, basically, a lot of the stars, you know, the mentality was that you know they could do it and they went to. And they couldn't. Uh, a lot of them couldn't accept the uh, the uh, normalcy yeah, of the. Uh, you know. Yeah, I remember when uh, Tom Seaver was announcing Yankee games for uh, Met games. He was doing a Met game. The Met uh, brought in some pitcher who was six ten, left-handed, who didn't have a real good fastball. He's trying to throw the fastball. He's getting clobbered. So uh, Seaver says, who does this guy think he is, Colfax or Carlton? And he really ripped into the guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, 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 basically, if they have the ability, I, you know, Ted Williams managed the, uh, you know, the Senators and, uh, you know, the, the last three years of the second team was in Washington the first year that they were in Texas. And he actually got them to, uh, you know, improve their hitting a couple of years, for a couple of years. But I don't know how, you know, he lasted that long. I'll tell you something. Ted Williams, according to Lenny Randall, was an incredibly great teacher. And one of the ways he would teach, he'd take guys out on his fishing boat. You know, he'd go fishing, and he was a you know champion. He was a great Hall of Fame fisherman. And he'd go out and he'd show, he'd use analogies of um, uh, grips on on the rod, uh, just all these things, analogies of waiting for your, you know, that's a fish, but is that the fish you want? You wait for your fish, that that kind of thing. And he actually would teach through through fishing, and um, Lenny Randall has talked for hours on the on his show on this network about uh, Ted and how he really could relate uh, to players. What he couldn't relate to was pitchers, 
Yeah. He didn't know. Th- he hated them. Th- <laughs> and his own, his own players. Yeah. He didn't know their names. He didn't <laughs> care their names. He had no interest in pitching. And uh, that's where he was a lousy. Uh, um, he turned out to be a lousy manager. He, yeah, another another Hall of Famer that was pretty good uh, was uh, Red Shaning. Oh yeah, I was I was thinking about that. There's a guy who lasted 45 years as an instructor, um, basically a teacher. Yeah, he's 95 years old now. Yeah. And I got to see him on uh, the opening day ceremonies out out there. He's still still hanging. He's now the oldest living Hall of Famer, which is absolutely amazing. Because between I think it was, I think it was after the '58 season, he developed tuberculosis. Yes, yeah, right. We, we sent him a card. Yeah. Okay. He got better. It worked. Yeah, we sent him a card. Gene, were you a fan when the in '56 when they they basically traded him for Alvin Dock? No, me, me, me and Sam usually were cried about it. Yeah, that uh, was like you know. I mean, I, I respected Dark and everything, but I mean, you know, Shanus was the Cardinals never had any pitching. It was you know, the '57 they were decent though, but they really didn't have. They never had like pitching in the '50s. Yeah, but were you upset but when Shane, they traded Shanus? Oh yeah, it was me. me you know, it was, yeah, Sam usually was a. Uh, I mean, yeah. You know, they tried to trade Musial for Robin Roberts. Yeah, that, that, that's when Bush. Right, got that's when that's when Bush got rid of him. Yeah. Hmm. yeah then he had Ken Boyer play. I, I play think I might field. have asked you, yeah. you guys this, and especially you, Al, because you are a, a pirate fan. I heard once that it came real close to, towards the end, and. Um, Musial wasn't particularly adverse to going back to finishing it out with the Pirates, and he's from Denora, Pennsylvania. I don't think that was ever a, a, a reality. But the one thing about the Pirates and Cardinals was Ken Boyer for Clemente. Oh, really? Well, that, that was, I don't know how, how deep it went, but that was... The a, worst trade from the Pirates' standpoint was when they sent Dick Groat to the Cardinals or... Don Cardwell and Julio go tie. Julio go tie. You yeah, good. The, the, with the Houston Astros. In fact, I, I was in such disbelief in that that uh, I called up the heard on the radio. I called up the newspaper, one of the papers there. So I heard this on the radio. Is this true? He said, "Yeah." I said, "Oh God," because they thought Dick Schofield, who they gotten from the Cardinals a bunch of years earlier, could play regularly. He couldn't. Right. Groke, I, Groke was I, terrific for the Cardinals uh, for a couple yeah, of years. He was 63 runner-up MVP behind Groke. Yeah, Tiger. and Groke told me that uh, when I interviewed him in 1985 that his, his three most enjoyable years in the majors were three years he was in St. Louis. Oh, that's very interesting on that, that part. Yeah, he didn't get along with Joe Brown, the general manager of the Pirates, for, you know, that was during that period. And the Cardinals integrated real good around that yeah. time too. That was part. Of, that was the whole thrust of uh, Albert Stan's book, October '64. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember hearing from um, David Finoli. You mentioned Clemente, and I saw that Elroy Face turned like ninety. Yeah, he was became ninety throughout the first pitch. When they open the season, he had a problem with Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's what Dave Finoli, Dave Finoli told Allen and I that he said basically uh, when he was informed that Clemente was killed, he said better him than me. Oh really? Yeah. Oh wow! I didn't know he knew that. He said that. Ooh, that was. So what on between them? I have no idea. He came out of the Dodgers system also. Like Clemente came out of the Dodger system. I didn't know that. Yeah. Did Branch Rickey bring him out of that? Yeah. Uh, as well? Yeah, drafted him. Wow. He was a starting Very pitcher uh, the first couple of years he was with the Pirates. I put him in the bullpen and the rest was history. That fork ball he had was. Yeah. Even though he was 18 and 1, he might have been better when they won it when he was 10 and 8 and he had more saves. You know, he. he, uh, he he, he, those days, they would bring the relief pitchers into tie games. 
the close, so-called closers and the tie games. Yeah, seven thirty. Then and, then. Yeah, now now forget it. I mean, a lot of them now can't ha- mentally can't handle coming in with men on base. Right. He was, he was about 5'7", well, 5'8". The five, adrenaline eight. only yeah. gets going when they think they can do something to impress the negotiators, um, their agents or whatever, to negotiate new contracts. It is strictly a money game. The home runs, the um, – I watch MLB, uh, the MLB channel, and guys like Sean Casey or th- today, he gets on there and he says – what is this crap in batting practice where the first 10 pitches you got to go inside out, you got to hit the ball the other way? Listen, you should take a swing or two to warm up. This is Casey talking. And then you should, all you should need to be practicing is your elevated angle. That's what really? you need. Yeah. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter if you can get the runner over. That's not the way the game is played today. This is, And you can go to the MLB channel. They run this crap, you know, all day long. They they keep going over, you know, it's four hours of program, programming over 24 hours. That's what they, that's what they preach now. Uh, I, talk, I talk to my guys on, uh, on the high school team and, uh, what's going on with your launch angle? You know, they, they look your, like, you know, your exit velocity, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that you can't practice. <laughs> I mean, you're at, how hard you hit the ball, you can't practice. But your stroke, just simply to get get the ball up in the air for no other reason, so you're going to either strike out, fly out, or hit a home run. Basically, uh-huh. like I hear, the one thing that I hear to the coaches. You know, because I do security at the games. Uh, hit hit the ball where it's pitched. If it's outside, you go to right field. If it's inside, you, you go to left. Whatever. It, oh, go not, with the, go with the pitch. Yeah, that's that's very cool. But that's not you know. the way that. You but 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 not having the elevated, you know. Yeah. Right. Where uh, okay. in the early nineties, I did a couple of presentations at Saber meetings on Rob Deere. You know, struck out. Uh, you know, he struck out 368. Like Carp hit 368, he struck out three device strikeouts by eight bats. And uh, but he was he. You know, now they all do it. He was, you know, unique. He was a pioneer in that. Yeah, well, King did a strikeout, a walk, or a uh, yeah. The guy never hit the double twice, but everything like Spil- everything was a fly Spil- ball. Go, Dick Stewart, maybe. Yeah. You could um, put in that classification. Swish Nicholson. Yeah, Dick, Dick, Dick Stewart, uh, somebody put up something on him on Facebook that I looked him up on reference. He led the, you know, he led the leagues, you know, uh, in the first baseman errors from 1958 through 1964. Whoa. Yeah, well, five uh, years with not, the Pirates and two years with the Red Sox. Not to change Jane, the did subject. Did you tell a story about him the other day? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, he once got, I was once, uh, you know, I, I went to the pit as a full shield for little games when I was there. And he once got standing off for picking up a hot dog wrapper. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it was a good he, thing he, that he didn't play game seven. And they had yeah. Rocky Nelson. Oh, I, I asked Dick Groat. That Yogi Berra hit would have been down the right. Oh, field yeah. I road. asked Dick Groat when I interviewed him uh, in 1985 about that. I said, I asked him, you know, what, what do you think would have happened if Stewart was playing first base instead of Rocky Nelson? He said, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> hey, and there's the trifecta that we all strive for. Rocky Nelson was the third guy on the Pirates out of that Dodger organization. Yeah. So um, there you go. And you a on that too. note, yeah. uh, we're going to wrap it up. This is, uh, as usual, one of my favorite nights of the week. Friday night with you guys is uh, informative, fun, and enjoyable. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. 
Yeah, both and the Pirates and the Cardinals will, will have a lot of success if they play the Reds every day. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? Yeah. At this stage, at this stage of the game. Um, okay. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. And we'll uh, we'll be back next week, same time, Al. Same bad time, same bad channel. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Adios, everybody. Bye.